All right. All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Great turnout. So most of you know me. I'm Danny Mando, and um, I'm really thrilled to have David DeYoung. I just asked him the correct pronunciation of his name. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so, um, so I'll tell you the story of what brought David here, and, uh, and, we'll, and then we'll take it from there. So I believe the Wall Street Journal had an article featuring this book. So I read the article, and I said, oh, that looks like an interesting book. So I ordered it, and I read it, and then I contacted David. And when I do these things, sometimes people respond. Most of the time, they don't, but David did. And uh, I was thrilled, so he said, you know, if you're ever in the States, um, if you're in Boston, let, let me know. And he did. So um, I'll give you a little bit of background. And what we're going to do is we're going to do back, some back and forth. David doesn't really want to do a lecture. Um, but I did write his official. So David DeYoung is a journalist and author. His first book, which is this book, and I have several copies over there, is called Nazi Billionaires. It's published in the US and the United Kingdom by HarperCollins. Uh, and it's being translated into 20 languages. Spent four years reporting from Berlin while researching and writing this book, and David previously covered European banking and finance from Amsterdam and hidden wealth from New York for Bloomberg News. His work also appeared in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and Bloomberg Business Week. A native of the Netherlands, David currently lives in Tel Aviv and works as a Middle East correspondent for the Dutch Financial Daily. So, um, so since we're going to do some back and forth, um, my first question to David is what, I'm going to give him some softball questions, but I think this is what people are interested in. <laughs> what inspired you to write a book about Nazi billionaires? I mean, I was, um, it started off in, in November 2011, or fall 2011, when I started at Bloomberg News in New York, and I was hired at a, a new team which investigated, uh, which was an investigative team which reported on family-owned companies, but more specifically non-stock exchange listed companies, so privately held companies. And I was hired as one of the North America reporters. But they soon asked me, like uh, two months in, whether I wanted to, could also ta take on the German-speaking countries to my beat, because I'm Dutch, so they, my bosses in New York naturally assumed, oh, this Dutch, we've got this Dutch guy here, I'm sure he speaks fluent German. Uh, so, you know, I couldn't really say no. I mean, I was a 25-year-old, you know, cub reporter, you know, I just graduated from my graduate, from graduate school, and, and of course, you know, I, I dove in, and I would spend a month a year uh, between Thanksgiving and Christmas, going to the uh, Bloomberg bureaus in, uh, in, in, in the German-speaking countries, so in Germany, Switzerland, and, and Austria. And the stories that I always came back with were um, it's a mix between the historical, the finan financial, and the business side of things. And what really struck me in my reporting was that you know, companies like BMW and Porsche, but particularly the families that control them today, which are, you know, the world's and Europe's and Germany's wealthiest dynasties, business dynasties today, um, you know, celebrate their fathers and grandfathers and their, their, their business patriarchs uh, and family patriarchs for their, you know, business successes, but leave out their uh, war crimes and their Nazi affiliations, you know, on global charitable foundations, on uh, media prizes, museums, academic chairs, um, corporate headquarters, you name it. After they say that they've reckoned with their past, but they, you know, in effect pay lip service kind of to this, to this German remembrance culture and, 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 and act instead they actively whitewash uh, history. So I wanted to shine a light on that because, because, uh, yeah, um, I thought it was it was uh, 
such a distortion of history uh, that was going on. So I wanted to give the backstory to all of that. And I, you know, to qualify for the book, you still had to be relevant in global business today. So the five families, you know, they either have, you know, one family controls BMW, the BMW Group, which includes BMW, Rolls Royce, and Mini, uh, own 47% of that. That's two siblings. And they just received a dividend last week of 1 billion euros. Uh, so 1 billion USD, I guess it's on par at this point. Um, and then you have you know, the Porsche Pierre family, uh, which controls the Volkswagen and, and, and the Porsche uh, Volkswagen Group, and they spun off Porsche last year um, for, and listed it on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange for 70 billion. But it also contains you know, Audi, Bentley, Lamborghini, uh, Seat, Skoda. And then thirdly, there's the Von Fink dynasty, which co-founded Allianz and Munich Re. Um, there's the Utker dynasty, which controls like a big baking goods conglomerate, and also largest German beer brewer, uh, luxury hotels. And fifthly, there's the um, Flick dynasty, which are the former controlling shareholders of, um, of Daimler-Benz. Um, so some of them don't have operative companies anymore, but they, you know, control multi-billion dollar family offices, which they invest, you know, all over the world, real estate, private equity, art, you know, hedge funds, you name it. Um, so, so I didn't focus on families like Thyssen or Krupp because they're no longer alive. They're, 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 these dynasties died out. I wanted to really focus on those that are active in global business and are also active whitewashing or denying history. And most importantly, historically speaking, they had to also be among the largest profiteers in the Third Reich. Being, you know, they had to be mass weapons producers. They had to be, in, engage on a wide scale in Aryanization, so the expropriation of, of Jewish owned businesses and the expropriation of Jewish families, which of course then continued on in the German occupied territories during World War II. And of course, the mass exploitation of, of forced and slave labor. So those were the criteria to, to qualify for, for Nazi billionaires. And what inspired you personally to write this book? I mean, yeah, I mean, it was, it, it was purely, it was, in that sense, it was, I mean, it was professional. It, it wasn't, you know, I write a little bit about my family in the book, mm, but that didn't lead, in the introduction of my book, and I'm, I'm happy to tell you the story, but that didn't lead me to, to, write, to, to, to write the book. But my family, like millions of, uh, tens of millions of other Europeans, you know, for my, my, my grandparents on my father's side were uh, Jewish, my grandfather hid in Amsterdam for three and a half years, uh, his stockings factory on the border of the Netherlands, and uh, Germany was was uh, expropriated or was put under a trustee. He got it back after after the war. But my uh, my grandmother, with my aunt, who at the time was three, she's she's much older than my dad. She they fled to um, Switzerland. My my grandmother was native. She's from was from Zurich originally. They fled to Switzerland in 1941, together with a, uh, a companion, companion Max van Damme, who was a famous painter, and they, uh, you know, they got caught by the Gestapo at the French-Swiss border, and the Gestapo officer took pity on my grandmother and, and my three-year-old aunt at the time, and, and said something, oh, report back tomorrow, like implicitly flee tonight. Um, and they fled over the mountains, but Max van Damme reported back the next day, and he got deported via Drancy to Sobibor and, and, and got murdered. On my mother's side, you know, my, my uh, grandfather was, you know, was a very active sailor in the Netherlands, and he tried to sail from the Netherlands to, uh, to England to join uh, the Royal Air Force together with his best friend. The first attempt failed. Second attempt also failed, and they got blown back to shore, and this is also about 1941, and they get arrested by, um, uh, by German soldiers. And they're convicted, actually, as, as political prisoners. And, and, and they're sentenced to two years of slave labor in a steel factory in, in the Ruhr area. And um, you know, he, when he 
got out in in 43 uh, or 44 you know he was uh, six foot five and you know he weighed you know 60 po he weighed uh, 100 uh, or 110 pounds it was you know he was uh, and he revived him he was revived in a sanatorium and then he married my grandmother so so but you know that but that's that's a story that tens of millions of Europeans have, and I'm, I mean, my family has been extremely lucky. I mean, my great grandparents, from my, from my uh, father's side, they did, they did. They, my great grandfather um, died in Bergen-Belsen, and, and but his his wife uh, survived. Um, so my great grandmother, but you know, I guess, yeah. I mean, we were very, we were extremely lucky from both sides uh, of the family. But 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 to your point, I mean, what my my personal, I mean. Um, yeah, motivation was the well was to get was was to get, was a professional motivation was to was to shine light on these stories was to bring you know uh, the driving arg argument of the book is historical transparency and I couldn't stand you know kind of the smugness of these families and these companies and that they were so you know that they thought that they could well and they're still doing it today that they could just celebrate uh, Nazi war criminals. Um, just because they were successful in business and, and think they could get away with that. And so my, my question also related to the, to the prior one I just asked you. You grew up in the Netherlands and how long, and, and so in our shul, uh, Israel is the future and we're very prosperous here. Um, in the United States as Jews, but Europe is dead. As Jews, Europe is dead. And what is it like, what is it for Jews, and what is it like growing up, finding out of all this stuff, living in, in the Netherlands, um, before you, you made Aliyah, or you're just living in Israel now, but, but you grew up in the Netherlands. So knowing these stories and living as a Jew in, in, uh, in Amsterdam it would be quite uh, interesting to hear about. Yeah, so first of all, so I'm, I'm technically not Jewish because my mother isn't Jewish and I didn't gr grow up Jew Jewish. So so that's, you know, I mean, that, that's a pretty, and you know, I mean, it's really interesting because of course, you know, my cousins, you know, from my father's side, I mean, my entire fa father's family is Jewish. So I have cousins who grew up in the Amsterdam Jewish community. And it's, you know, my perspective, especially now that I'm living in Israel, it, it was the Jewish community in Amsterdam. It's it's very it's 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 you know they like so many Jewish communities in, in in Europe, they closed they closed ranks you know after the war. What who, who who was left? And it was a very it was quite it was quite an insular uh, from the outside. You know it was quite an insular uh, community. And of course you know I see my cousins now. I speak with them, and they're still very much you know, and they, you know I see them when when they come to visit uh, Israel. Um, but, you know, I think one of the main things, and, and, and just uh, the, um, there's a really good book that just came out, was just published a couple of weeks ago, called The Diary Keepers, by a woman named Nina Sigal, who is the New York Times correspondent f uh, based in Amsterdam. But she's a you know, Jewish woman from, from Manhattan, and, and she moved to Amsterdam in 2006. And she was living in the center where the old Jewish quarter was. And she's like, well, there's all these te testimonies to you know Jews, and there's a beautiful Portuguese synagogue right in the center, but where are all the Jews? And I think, you know, the Netherlands, one of their, one of the things that they've hidden extremely well is that, you know, after Poland and Hungary, you know, 75 of, of, of Dutch Jewry were, uh, were deported and, and, and murdered. And, and there it has also not been a reckoning on the Dutch part, you know, on the Dutch side with, with uh, you know, with, with, their, with their history of collaboration, for example, because everybody fashioned themselves like they were in the resistance, you know, after the war. And, you know, and that is extremely, extremely far from the truth. Um, you know, now finally, two years ago or a year and a half ago, the name monument, the n names monument, opened and it was was uh, uh, revealed in the center of Amsterdam, which was made by Daniel Lieveskind, who also um, made the uh, designed the Holocaust Museum in in Berlin um, and many other um, 
yeah memorials uh, to to the Shoah, and it, it's 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 be the record that reckoning is 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 also happening, and it was also something for me. Yeah, I mean, because um, growing up, you don't really have a con you don't really have a conscious of it. My, my my Jewish grandmother lived in Switzerland. She moved back to Switzerland after uh, together with my grandfather, who was Dutch Jewish, but he already passed away quite early. And so it was actually only, I guess, when I moved to the U.S., you know, when I moved to New York at 23, that I, you know, that is like, ah, here's where all, these are all the Jews are, you know? I mean, that was my, yeah, I mean, yeah, that was my experience, you know? Ah, and uh, so, uh, yeah, and, and, and of course, you know, one of the most, I moved from New York in, so I moved to New York in, in September t um, uh, 2009, and then I moved um, from New York to Berlin in, in, in October 2017. And yeah, for the research and writing of the book. So, and, and of course I spent, you know, four years doing this research and writing in Berlin. And, uh, um, and then now, now we're living in Israel, and, and the reason that we're in Israel, also to ask if I made uh, Aliyah, which I have not, uh, which I would have uh, qualified in a day, uh, because, you know, of course, if you have a Jewish father under the law of the right of return, you know, you, you, get a, you can make Aliyah uh, easily. But it was actually my fiance's job. She is German, and she is the German television correspondent for Israel and the Palestinian territories. So, and she studied Arabic and Hebrew. And uh, we actually first met in New York, but, and, and then, you know, she got her, this was her dream job, you know, and that's the reason that we ended up moving to, uh, to Israel and then got a job as a Middle East correspondent. Of course, you know, the last couple of months I've been writing a lot about what's everything that's going on in Israel, you know, I mean, it's, it's yeah, but that's a different, different story and, and, and discussion, I mean. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but um, yeah, busy times to say the least. Yeah. So, I don't need a mic. Anyway. Okay. All right. Um, so I, I'm very interested. So you live in Israel. Yeah. And there, we all know there's a lot going on. Right. right. But what's been the reaction to? Is this important to to Israeli society? Is the Shoah still? Does it still resonate? No, no, absolutely not. So the Hebrew version, the Hebrew translation of the book actually came out two weeks ago, and it was actually the cover of, of the re review was the cover of Haaretz, uh, of, this, of the weekend edition, um, uh, of the which, which comes on, on Friday, so it's, yeah, it was two weeks ago. They did a really nice uh, cover, and I got a lot of response for it, and I was interviewed by uh, Galatz, you know, the, the army radio, or army radio, I mean, it's one of the main radio stations in, in, in Israel. And um, yeah, um, it, so it's it's yeah. I mean, there's still so many um, survivors of the Shoah, but but that was of the of the Hebrew edition, which just came out. But when the English edition came out, I mean, there was a massive piece in a massive piece in in Haaretz, the, uh, the the English version of Haaretz, Jerusalem Post, Times of Israel. Um, so and I even got got. Um, Got interviewed by um, an Haredi um, a publication, yeah, from from Borough Park in New York. Um, uh, interviewed me, so it's it's so there was there was yeah a lot of interest um, uh, there as well. And of course, I mean, there's still so many. I mean, there, there's still many survivors. Actually, I have a relative, Mary Vroman, who turned 101. Uh, last month, yeah, no, in mid February, yeah, mid February, um, you know, she moved with her um, husband. Her husband's entire family was murdered in Sobibor. Um, her husband was also a Dutch Jew, Sander Vroman, and um, they made Aliyah in 1950. Um, and Mary's mother, uh, pardon, Mary's father and younger sister were, were both murdered in Auschwitz, and. She and her mother survived, and, and they all made Aliyah, and you know, I mean, she's 100, and she lives in, in, in Haifa, in uh, Bet Yolis, which is a Dutch-run, um, or Dutch-financed 
uh, old people's uh, home. And it was it, when I first met her, you know, and she heard that, you know, I had a German girlfriend and I was living in Berlin, you know, she said, yeah, you know, Hitler tried to, uh, you know, tried to murder all of us, you know, but, you know, we're still here, you know, and for her, for some, for somebody like me, you know, who's, you know, that I was living in, in Germany and, and that I had a German girlfriend, I think that was really, she did still, she found that, she found that quite, you know, I, and I can understand that, you know, she found it hard to grasp, you know, and I, I can, I could, could also, I could, but there's not, it doesn't really, you know, there's no, it's not like there's, re there's still lingering resentment in, 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 in Israel against Germany. I mean, you see so, m you know, there's so many German delegations all the time. And if you see also, I mean, it's also, you walk such a thin line as a, uh, as a, as a journalist, as a German journalist reporting on, on, uh, on Israel, you know, it's it's you have zero leeway, and I see the resource they throw at like a bureau. They have like thirty people, you know, they have thirty people there. It's like the best finance bureau, I would I would say, out of all the foreign bureaus in in Israel. So, um, and especially at a time when, you know, the situation is extremely fraught domestically in Israel, and and you need to get the story right. So, so yeah. Yeah. And what are the what are the um, the companies that we'd be familiar with today? So it's so it's the Quant Dynasty which controls BMW. It's the Flick Dynasty which controlled Daimler Benz. It's um, the von Fink Dynasty which co-founded uh, Allianz and Munich Re, the, the big reinsurer, the insurers and, and reinsurers. Um, and they also founded a private bank called called Merck Fink. Um, it's the Porsche Pierre family, which controls Porsche and Volkswagen, but also Audi and, and, and other uh, brands. And it's um, the Utker fa family, the dynasty, which uh, has this big baked goods conglomerate and, and beer brewers. And there's also a family that I give at the end of the book called the Ryman's, which as a kind of counter example, because they have such a bizarre story, but they actually control the most American brands. They control you know, Pete's Coffee, a Panera Bread, uh, Snapple, Seven Up, um, Einstein, Einstein, Einstein's Bros Bagels. I mean, you can really, you can go on and on their own, like all kind of these uh, uh, Krispy Kreme donuts. Um, yeah, so, yeah, but they, but I give them as a Ryman, but they're, they're, they're very few people know about them because there they're, they're, has never been a photo published of any of the members. Um, and like many of the other families in my in my book, they traded in their their German passports for Austrian ones uh, because uh, it doesn't have any inheritance tax in Austria. And I would also argue that Austria is even you know, in c especially compared to Germany, has done non almost nothing about reckoning with their past. You know, they always seem to dodge and dive. You know, and 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 yeah. They don't get as they don't get as much scrutiny as 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 Germany, which you know, given you know, yeah, of course Hitler was Austrian, for example, right. and yeah. And my question related to those companies is because you say they're still around today, they're still vibrant, they're still part of Berlin. So how did they get all that money out? I mean, the, the war ended; they definitely. Yeah. I mean, it was p a, a political expedient decision on the side of, 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 you know, in Western Germany, on the side of the Ameri I mean, the American authorities or well, the Truman administration in early 1947, when when the uh, when the Cold War starts, um, you know, a decision is made uh, to rebuild West Germany uh, as a viable democratic state. Um, and as a, you know, and as a strong economy, um, as a buffer and a bulwark against uh, the Soviet Union and encroaching communism, etc., which is a policy decision I can understand. But the two, two major decisions that followed, first of all, 
they let all of German business or in, in West Germany keep everything, you know, except for IG Farben, which, you know, at the time was the largest chemical and, and, and pharmaceutical conglomerate, uh, which was broken up into Bayer, which is still today, one of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies, BASF, which is still one of the world's uh, largest chemical companies, uh, and Hurst, which is no longer around anymore, but was also massive chemical companies. No company was broken up. And none of the business uh, German business as a whole was not, in Western Germany, was not uh, expropriated. They weren't allowed, they, they were all allowed to keep, um, keep their assets. Um, whereas, of course, in, in Eastern Germany, they were wholesale expropriated by the Soviet um, authorities. And, but, the, and the, but the second thing, which is even more important, is that, you know, in, in, over the course of 1947-1948, you have hundreds of thousands of um, suspected uh, Nazi war criminals and, and ardent Nazi sympathizers who uh, the US and the UK hand over back to West German authorities for the so-called denazification trials, which were in effect layman trials, um, you know, that designed to, yeah, to denazify uh, Germany. But there was of course no incentive on the side um, uh, of the denazification panels and committees and, um, and tribunals to, um, you know, mete out punishment for crimes that they them themselves had committed or for sympathies that they had shared in. So one of the myths I'm really trying to dispel of the book is, you know, denazification never took place in Germany. There was a continuation of money and power from, um, from, that, from, from 1945 from, from, the, from the Third Reich to Western Germany and it's five years of vacuum from 1945 to 1950 where, you know, the Allies, or yeah, could have, uh, where the Americans could have really, uh, you know, denied, properly at least have, you know, um, uh, had a proper um, over overlooking the uh, denazification trials, not giving you know, not giving not giving it to to the Western authority without any kind of oversight. That was the word I was looking for. Without oversight, you know, that was that was yeah. And it's not only for the business world. You know, it's all aspects of German society in, in the legal world, academia, media, uh, medical world. You know, denazification just uh, never took place. And in order to get your assets back, or in order to be able to go back to work, you had to, um, you know, you had to, you had to be denazified, and then you got your, then you got all your assets back. So, of all the uh, main characters in my book, with the exception of Friedrich Flick, who was uh, tried at Nuremberg, was convicted for war crimes and crimes against humanity, uh, to seven and a half years together with his fellow managers were two under industrious, uh, industrial, uh, industrialist trials against IG Farben, the entire executive board of IG Farben, and uh, Krupp, uh, Alfred Krupp and his managers. You know, Friedrich Flick, you know, John J. McCloy, the high, uh, the, um, the American, um, uh, the high commissioner for occupied uh, Germany, he, in 1950, uh, commuted, uh, started commuting all the sentences uh, of, of the convicted industrialists, and not only of the convicted in industrialists, mind you, but also of, of SS officers who had been sentenced to death, who had slaughtered hundreds of thousands of Jews, and it was, it was the, their death sentences were turned to, to uh, life sentences, and their life sentences by the mid-1950s were turned in, were, were commuted, and they were, they were, you know, they went, they went called free, they, they were released. So, so, and that was a, yet again a political expedient decision because the Korean War starts, Eisenhower invokes the War, War Defense Act, all the American um, factories start producing for the war effort in, uh, in Korea, and Western Germany is the key Western, uh, Western industrialized nation that can kind of fill the gap and start produ produ producing consumer goods 
Um, and, you know, uh, the then uh, Chancellor, uh, Konrad Adenauer, played that leverage that, you know, that the U.S. needed them as an ally in the Cold War, as an ally in the Korean War, for them to produce consumer goods. And y they basically said, well, then, yeah, you have to let our men go because you're holding our men on our land, uh, you, you know, occupied, and, you know, you're no, no longer occupying Western Germany. So then release our men, you know, and... and uh, and, they, and, and John J. McCloy, who never gave, and I've been to the McCloy archives at, at Amherst College, you know, and, and there's still a lot redacted, um, because there was never a kind of any rationale, and he was fiercely attacked uh, for it, for, you know, not only for releasing uh, men like uh, Krupp and Flick, but, you know, particularly for those who, for those SS officers who had slaughtered hundreds of thousands. Uh, and in the case of Friedrich Flick, you know, he's released in 1950. And within a decade, he's back on top as Germany's richest man as the controlling shareholder of Daimler-Benz. And, you know, by the time he dies in 1972, he's one of the world's uh, top five richest men, together with John Paul Getty and, and et cetera. So it's, yeah. So... At the back of the book, I li of course, I reached out to all of them for their responses, or for with initially with interview requests, and they all um, they all declined to be interviewed, except for one grandson of Friedrich Flick, who is almost eighty and lives um, in London, and he wrote to me. He was quite. Candid, you know, he's quite candid and, and reflective. But he and he wrote to me, one point, you know, yes, terrible things have come out about my grandfather, but he gave us so much more than wealth alone. Now, what exactly he gave them, you know, remains remains unclear. But, but, um, uh, but you know, and all the others. So after they declined interview requests, like the Quan, the BMW Quans or the Porsches, you know, um, I then sent you know, many questions to their spokespeople, either at, their, at the company, at companies like BMW, Porsche, or Utker, or to their family offices. And, um, you know, some answered, uh, their spokespeople, some of them answered part of my questions. But, um, you know, they were very, yeah, uh, they were, they were kind of non-answers, but which, you know, it worked, it, it I mean, and for and I think from my perspective, you know, I really see it as this was really the chance for them to come clean, in a way, or like at least reflect about um, why are they deciding to still, you know, um, champion Nazi war criminals or without without transparency or or either or most probably distort history. But because of these non-answers, you know, it's so jarring their responses to it, the contents of the book that you know it, yeah. It ended up working well for the book in, in terms of that contrast, but I've, you know, it's a shame because I think it would have been a perfect opportunity for them to to respond. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Correct. So to, to your question, so, so Theo, oh, sorry, yes, absolutely. So the first question is about um, uh, Carl and Theo Albrecht, who owned, they're both dead now, but they owned, uh, they co-founded, no, they founded uh, Aldi, which is a massive uh, wholesale grocer. Um, and, well, exactly, it's in the U.S. now as well. Um, but they also own Trader Joe's, or at least one branch owns Trader Joe's. And, um, and Greg asked, Greg asked if, if um, uh, what what their history is. So they were actually they were I think born in the late twenties and they, they they just they they served as soldiers in the Wehrmacht. Um, so yeah, I mean there was nothing. Um, I, I wrote a, I wrote on, I wrote about them quite. A bit, I wrote a few stories about them uh, for Bloomberg, but but nothing. With, with, yeah, in relation to their Nazi past, because they were not, 
you know, like Ferry Porsche, they were not voluntary SS officers or, you know, it's in Wehrmacht. Yeah, and that was also just a drafted. And so that, that's a little bit, and they were not members of the Nazi party, which was, um, yeah, also an important criteria whether to look into somebody or not. And now to your second question, what, what surprised me the most uh, during my research and reporting, I, I think two things. I think I went into it naively. I think I thought it would be, there would be kind of somehow, there would be remorse or reflection on their actions somewhere on, on the side of the patriarchs. Um, and there was just, there was, there was, there was just none. There was just no kind of, and also on the side of their heirs, you know, um, n no contrition, no kind of, you know, no, I think that that is what surprised me to put it mildly um, the most. And also how deeply involved they were with, with, um, with, the, with the Nazi regime. Um, they, you know, they, they had zero, they had no compunction. Um, I mean, they were for the most part, they were opportunists, you know, they weren't ideologues. They thrived in any political system, whether it was the German Empire or, you know, the uh, Weimar Rep uh, Republic, the Third Reich, occupied Western Germany, Western Germany, re re reunified Germany. Um, but 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 it's the, the the breadth of their involvement, you know, that they had. N there was no question. Once Hitler promised them in early 1933 and to you know initiate the largest rearmament program that the world had ever seen to date, and you know this comes off the back of the Great Depression and of course much political volatility in Germany, and they you know they they fall in line and you have, before you know it, you had you had billions of of, of Reichsmarks flowing to their coffers and and into their and back into their uh, companies and factories, and. Um, uh, you know, but that quickly devolves into criminal um, uh, because weapons production itself is wasn't criminal. But then, you know, it quickly devolves into criminal behavior with the expropriation of Jewish-owned businesses, and um, from 1935 onwards, which initially also has the veneer of a legal transaction, and then as the 1930s, um, you know, uh, go on. It, it, it devolves into outright theft and robbery and, you know, they do away with the contracts and they, uh, they yeah, you know, they just steal uh, uh, companies as they see fit, which is, this, which is that behavior then continues in, in German occupied territories uh, across Europe. And of course, with, with as, a, as a, you know, low point, of course, the, the, the um, exploitation of 12 to 20 million uh, forced enslaved laborers and in, in who were deported from all over Europe uh, uh, to be, yeah, to be exploited in, in, in German factories and mines. And there was no, you know, so it was, it was the deepness of it and, and the fact that there was no kind of remorse whatsoever. That surprised me the most. Yeah, right. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, it's a bizarre story, and some of you may remember the story that came out uh, in May twenty, June twenty nineteen, in the Times, in the New York Times. So the the Ryman family, um, which owned a chemical company called Benckiser, um which is still now a massive conglomerate uh, behind Unilever and. Um, PNG, thank you. Um, uh, called Racket Bankiser, and they in 2012 they initiated basically con uh, this this strategy that they would buy up, uh, become the biggest player in the coffee market and um, and um, other consumer goods as well. And they and in 2019 there was a massive scoop in in the Bild, which is Germany's largest tabloid about the dark history of, uh, basically, the, the subtitle of my book, The Dark History of Germany's Wealthiest Dynasty, so singular. Um, uh, and it was about how the Ryman, how the Ryman, the father and grandfather Ryman were these convinced Nazis who had even served in, in their local municipality as Nazi members for the NSDAP, um, 
who you know wrote letters to Himmler and you know saying we're an Aryan company, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, whose sister got married to an SS man. It was like a really family full of ideologues. And then two months later, this massive piece, of this massive, uh, um, yeah, article appears in the Times. And, and, and the heirs didn't know about it. So in 2019, this was all a total shock to them, and et cetera. And then t uh, three months later, article appears in the Times um, with this kind of, you know, schlocky uh, title. It's um, uh, the f our father was a Nazi, and then he fell in love with a Jewish woman or something. Where it turns out that Albert Raimann Jr., after the war, so so he starts in a f uh, is married, but has a childless marriage, um, and starts an affair with one of his employees, called Emily Landecker, um, and they have three children. They have three children. Comes from that affair, and they and his his wife kind of you know condones it. It's you know, so. They become, the, they become the main shareholders of the Raimann Empire, but it turns out that Emily Landecker's father, Alfred Landecker, was a Jewish man who was deported, uh, was, was, uh, was deported from Germany, from Mannheim, and, 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 and murdered. And so they have this bizarre history of having been both descended from um, perpetrator and victim. And so when they find all of this out over the course of 2019, they decide to, you know, for lack of a better word, kind of put their money where their mouth is and donate 250 million euros um, to a foundation which they rename after their murdered grandfather, Alfred Landecker, um, and, but still be transparent about the fact that they are descendant also that their that their that their father was a and the grandfather were you know convinced Nazis, so of course this is a unique case, but it's such a stark contrast as Germany's new richest family with the way that the Quants responds, you know, holding on to maintaining the BMW Foundation Herbert Quant, for example, a massive charitable foundation which has a mission inspire responsible leadership model respire uh, inspire responsible leadership in the name of a man who you know built a, a sub concentration built a concentration camp in german occupied poland you know exploited thousands of uh, forced enslaved laborers in um, in berlin battery factories and acquired companies stolen from jews in france and and today i mean if you go on their website now you know um uh, you know, to to have a massive, uh, you know, uh, massive global charitable foundation with the motto "Inspire Responsible Leadership" in the name of a Nazi war criminal, and just because he saved BMW from bankruptcy in 1960 and made his family uh, Germany's richest, you know, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't excuse anything. And there, and there, you know, it was that kind of whitewashing that really, that kind of brazen whitewashing or distortion of history that that also just yeah. It made my made my made my blood boil and wanted me to write a book about it. <laughs> That's uh, yeah. Um, there has been one response. Um, the book has been extremely well received in Germany. It, it's been selling really well. The German translation came out two weeks after the the English language uh, or the original edition. So in May, May, uh, May last year, and um, it, you know, it has already. It's the only country which, where not only did they make, you know, has the that the German translation has been selling really well, but also they did a special edition. And now two weeks ago, I got an email from the German publisher saying that they're going to produce a edition of the book which only costs five euros, but it's financed by the D German federal government to get it into the hands of, of, of people who don't normally, who don't usually read books or who don't have the, the means to normally to, to pay, you know, th 30 euros or 30 bucks for a, for a book. So, um, so that has been the only response is that they're actually making kind of a, 
a cheap edition of a book which are going to spread really widely, which you know goes to show that, that you know I think that shows the impact that the book has had uh, in, in Germany, I would say. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, where it leaves me, I mean, I think that, that people should make up their own minds with regards to their consumerism. I mean, I would never try any, drive a German car, but not out of uh, uh, reasons, but just out of aesthetic reasons, because I think I just don't like these guys, you know? But, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but but what I do think, what it's, what's important is that, you know, when you, is, is a certain awareness that if you spend money on these products, there's many other products like it, that you know, it can go towards you know, becoming dividends for these families and go towards maintaining, you know, again, you know, global charitable foundations, media prizes, academic chairs, museums, corporate headquarters in the name of Nazi war criminals. So it is to, to, to create a certain sense of, of, of awareness. But you know, again, I mean, the book is is an arg argument for historical transparency, and and it is it, it does you know, and, and two major developments have come out of the book so far, and one is that, and and we haven't really touched upon that, but one major storyline of the book is about a man named Adolf Rosenberger, who was the Jewish co-founder of Porsche, and he, um, together with um, Ferdinand Porsche, and um, who of course, invented the, who became Hitler's favorite engineer and, and invented the Volkswagen, um, and his son-in-law, Anton Pierre. And Adolf Rosenberger was pushed out of the company, was out of, pushed out of Porsche in 1935, um, and erased, subsequently erased from, from Porsche history. And he immigrated in, in 1939 um, from Paris to, uh, he, he leaves Germany then after he's, in, in 1938 he leaves Germany, he goes to Paris, and then he moves from Paris, he immigrates to the United States, and he settles in Los Angeles. And um, Porsche had its IPO last year, which I referred to earlier, and there was so much, uh, you know, there was a lot of pressure on the Porsche family to clean house before the IPO uh, happened. And they had been negotiating, because there had already been a, a, a financial, there had already been a financial settlement uh, in 1950, which in which Adolf, Ro Adolf Rosenberger, with 10% of the shares of Porsche, gets 50,000 Deutschmark and a choice between a, a Porsche, uh, the first Porsche sports car, and or the Volkswagen Beetle. He ends up picking the Beetle, um, but of course, you know, 10% of Porsche, you know, is, was imagine if if they had. You know, Porsche was listed for 70 billion, and if the Porsche and uh, the Rosenberger era still had 10 percent of the um, of the shares, so in, instead there was a a month after the IPO happened, so in late October last year, there was a settle, there was a uh, an agreement announced between the uh, heirs of uh, the Porsche Pierre family and um, and the uh, uh, Rosenberger heirs who live in Claremont, uh, California, and that there would be that Adolf Rosenberger would get his rightful place back uh, in the history of Porsche, and he would be rewritten into the history uh, of Porsche as a co-founder of Porsche, as a financial backer of Porsche. And um, yeah, I mean, so that that's one of the major developments. And the other one is that an Israeli, um, uh, Israeli-British man named Anton, Anton Goodman had received money from the BMW Foundation Herbert Quant um, to, uh, he lives in Tzur Hadassah, which is south of Jerusalem, 
and um, he had received money to bring Israelis and Palestinians closer together. And he read an interview with me in The Guardian May last year, and he was furious about having been lied to by the foundation and by BMW about the having received, as a Jewish man, having received money in the name of a Nazi war criminal. So he started this whole he called to action from his other fellows around the world of the BMW Foundation who had received money and kind of pushed them, you know, to to transparency or to own up to who Herbert Quant really was. And and already within, he, he organized a seminar and, and already within six weeks, so end of June last year, they put out his massive mea culpa statement, which for in which in German time is like light years, like six six weeks is like it's so quick, you know, because it moves so slowly there everything. And but that's still not enough. So they're now they're pushing for. For uh, there he, the, the fellows him and and, and the other um, foundation fellows are pushing for um, more change and you know they want to have the name they, they want to have the name of Herbert Quant removed. Uh, from the foundation, but you know, of course, they're stuck between the board is stuck between these angry fellows, and of course, between Stefan Quant, who's the son of Herbert Quant, who's Germany's richest man, who's the controlling shareholder of BMW, and he's also the largest political donor to the Christian Conservative uh, Party, Angela Merkel's uh, party. So it, it's going to be interesting how that that's going to play out. Everybody always asks me about Hugo Boss, which is so interesting because there is no family behind Hugo Boss anymore. And for example, the Quants, they also they they were a massive textile family, and they also um, um, you know uh, produced the, these uniforms like SS, SA, uh, etc. Um, uniforms for uh, for yeah um, uh, for for the Nazi empire and and if, uh, and for some reason the focus is always on Hugo Boss I always get a question but but no I didn't look into Hugo Boss because now I think it's owned, owned by a private it hasn't been owned by by a family f in decades and um, yeah it it and and they were so mi they were comparatively minor to to the play to the people that I write about in the book that that I didn't really pay attention to them no. Montreal. Montreal, Toronto, and uh, uh, we did, we do have the books if you'd like to uh, purchase it. If not, I'll, I'll have them. Um, so I will be remiss, and I would not be like me if I didn't uh, tell you that this talk tonight was sponsored by the Bel Air. So, uh, so thank you, Larry, and, the, and uh, the Brotherhood Group for, uh, for sponsoring David. Thank you, Danny. And if you have a book, I'm happy to sign it as well. And if you have any questions, feel free to come up to me.